Start recording so I don't forget in a minute. I'll uh, we'll just give it a few more minutes, I suppose, let people drift in. Yeah, I suspect that going back to the ancient historians is, uh, yeah, it's kind of, there have been sort of two, there are two trains of the seminar, and I think I'm the only one on the, <laughs> unless is Rosie Harmon um, doing doing a paper or? She is, yeah, she, yeah. Oh, she well, is, great. Because yeah. I know she's been on parental leave. Yeah. So I'm not sure whether. Yeah, we kind of, I, I said to her, you know, if it's not possible, don't worry about it. But she was very keen. So she's supposed to be oh, coming today. Nice. She, was, she messaged me saying she was very keen to come to today's one. So hopefully we'll see her in a minute. Nice. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was just wondering whether, yeah, whether or not she would, uh, would really be coming. But I did, I did notice her there when you sent out the first. So you're flying the fly for classicists for the series. Not exactly. Only, only two of us seem to be flying the class as this flag so uh yeah <laughs> no pressure <laughs> oh well but this is great there's like a big crowd I was thinking it might just be like the two of us <laughs> <laughs> so yeah you let me know Aaron when you want when you want me sure will do I'm just going to post the so I sent I emailed out the handout and I'm just going to post it again in the chat box for anyone who didn't get that so in case anyone didn't get the handout i sent out in the email it's just coming up in the chat box as well now um oh i guess we may as well one minute past we may as well start um so we're recording yeah uh, so welcome back to this the eighth session of the essence of history seminar series I'm delighted this week to introduce uh, Emily Baragwana, who is Associate Professor of Classics at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Professor Baragwana completed her doctorate at the University of Oxford in 2005 and has been at North Carolina since 2007. Her first monograph, Motivation and Narrative in Herodotus, <clears throat> based on her PhD thesis, was published in 2008 and she is also the co-editor of Myth, Truth and Narrative in Herodotus, published in 2012, and Cleo and Thalia, Attic Comedy and Historiography, published in 2017. She is currently working on her next monograph titled Xenophon's Women. So it's my absolute pleasure now then to hand over to Emily Baragwanath for her paper, Perception as Essence in Ancient Greek Historiography. Emily. Thank you very much, Aaron, and thanks to all of you for coming. The seminar series brings us together to ponder whether history has an essence, and if so, what that essence has seemed to think us through time to be. As Aaron wrote in the description, what is history? What in the progress of historical thought from antiquity to modernity did we lose along the way? And what does it mean, if it means anything at all, to have history? to be historical. I'll be focusing on historical thought in ancient Greece, leaving those working on more contemporary thinkers uh, to address what we might have lost or gained along the way. In light of the extremely thought-provoking papers I've heard so far in the seminar series, uh, or read afterwards in some cases, my sense is that Herodotus um, relegated to myth and to divine understanding certain facets of history that 19th century philosophers of history deemed central and even essential. David Carr commented that one of our earlier speakers was talking about the essence of being a historian rather than the essence of history. And this is what I'll be doing too, since the ancient historians were acutely aware of an inevitable connection between those two things. Times historians, uh, sorry, Times Traveller, um, in fact, would be an apt description of Herodotus. Again, to invoke an earlier discussion in this seminar, Herodotus is profoundly aware of his responsibility as a historian, of his own powers of perception and judgment as key, of the choices he's making, and of the compulsion that presses down on him, as when he's constrained to express a disagreeable opinion about the vital role in the Persian Wars uh, victory of the now hated Athenians. Um, this is handout one. Hopefully you have a handout where you can see it in the, in the chat. 
Aaron posted it. So he says, at this point, I am constrained by necessity to set forth a gnome judgment or opinion, which will be displeasing to most, but I will not refrain from saying what seems to me to be true. His histories offers us a glimpse of formal historiography taking shape by drawing from, even as it defines itself against, competing modes of historical consciousness, including myth, epic, and divination. And looking at how he sets himself against these rival modes gives us some sense of his understanding of the essence of history, an understanding shared at least to some extent by his fellow Greek historians. I begin with myth. To the Greeks, the body of their traditional tales was their past, and it formed a powerful and ever relevant continuum with the present. Physical spaces, often with visible Bronze Age remains, cued stories about the heroes who were imagined as, as belonging to them. And the Greeks could connect their stories through cult and genealogies, as well as through the visual and verbal constructions of the distant past. Great contemporary events like the Persian War victory and the stories of contemporary individuals were conceptualized on the model of myths and shaped heroically. So myth and history were in many contexts not strongly dis uh, distinguished from one another. Public orators and monuments pictured chronological continuity from the exploits of heroic times to those of recent history and the Hellenistic Parian Chronicle, for instance, could date events like the flood of Duclaic Deucalion alongside historical events without registering a difference. And yet, and yet, the idea of a history-myth polarity is not only a modern construction. The world of the distant past, as the fifth century Greeks themselves understood it, was in some ways unlike the world of contemporary reality. Heroes were bigger and stronger. Gods communed with mortals. There's also a strong sense of the difficulty of knowing accurately about that early period. And those two ideas can occur together. As where Herodotus dismisses Minos as first ruler of the sea in favor of the sixth century BCE, the Thessalocrat Polycrates, and points to the unknowability of whether the former was qualitatively different from the latter. He writes, and this is handout number two, he writes, Polycrates is the first of the Greeks we know to have set his mind on ruling the sea excluding Minos of Knossos, and if indeed someone else before him ruled the sea. But of the Genae, the, the period of time or age um, or race, this word can mean any of these things, um, the Genae called human, Polycrates was the first. So Herodotus leaves aside Minos in favor of Polycrates, or rather leaves aside any tradition that would like to put Minos on a par with Polycrates, without realizing that he belongs to a completely different era and perhaps even to a different non-human race. Of whom we know is a phrase he frequently deploys to underscore the limits of certain knowledge. For Herodotus, the extents of mythical and historical time are a function of epistemology. In Egypt, one can do historical research even on the Trojan War since the Egyptian priests have been expert custodians of historical knowledge. Not so in Greece. The histories advertises a focus on knowable human time and helps readers to become better receivers of information about the past, more discriminate about sources, more aware of the possibility of partisanship. The work trains them to discriminate between mythical codes and historical codes as between the contrasting traditions of historical consciousness they represent. Robert Fowler, um, emeritus um, professor of Greek in Bristol and author of the monumental volumes um, collecting early Greek um, uh, myth mythographical um, texts and fragments, has remarked that, quote, even if Herodotus does not use the word mythos to mean myth, his historia, which is historia in Ionic Greek, his historia contributed decisively to the process by which this equation came about. An example is how, after opening his histories 
with the stories of abductions of princesses, Io, Medea, and Helen, as allegedly told by Persian and Phoenician wise men, Herodotus takes distance. He writes, and this is handout number three, these, I'm sorry, there's a typo, these are the stories of the Persians and the Phoenicians. I won't say that these events occurred in this or in some other way. Instead, I'll name the man I know first began unjust, Greek, unjust de deeds against the Greeks. And after indicating him, I'll advance to the furthest point, farthest point of my account, traversing alike small and large cities of human beings. For of those that long ago, Topali, were great, the majority have become small. And those which were great in my own time were small in times past. Knowing then that human prosperity never resides in the same place, I'll make mention of both alike. And note how Herodotus self-historicizes himself saying, those which were great in my own time, he uses the imperfect. Herodotus's designation here of key traditional stories of myth, Medea, Helen um, of Troy, as <clears throat> unknowable, can reasonably be applied as, as Fowler has seen to quote, the whole class of stories to which these ones belong. And so in the histories, a critical space is opening up between ancient and modern. Fowler pinpoints Herodotus' status as first Greek historian on the fact he discovered, quote, the problem of sources. We also find Herodotus distinguishing himself as practitioner of historia, specifically from the epic bard, purveyor of myth. Consider what he says about Homer's river, Okeanos or Oceanos, Oceanos or Ocean, mentioned in the course of a discussion of the unusual timing of the inundation of the Nile. In this polemical section of his Egypt book, Herodotus rejects three theories of some Greeks who claim wisdom. The second theory explains the behavior of the Nile as a consequence of its connection to ocean, which, rose, ro uh, which flows around the world. Herodotus writes, this is handout four, the second theory is even more ignorant and epistemonestere, not knowing, unskillful, even more ignorant than the one I've just mentioned. Though it's more striking in expression, it claims that it's because the Nile flows from the ocean that it manages to do what it does and that the ocean surrounds the whole world. Herodotus considers this theory, which his prose writing predecessor Hecateus is known to have shared, the least credible of the three he includes on the basis of the criterion of knowledgeability. An epistemon here can denote not only unintelligent, but also lacking in skill. The inventor of the ocean theory lacked the skillful methodology on which Herodotus prided himself. A short while later, he writes, this is handout number five, it's impossible to argue against the person who spoke about the ocean because the tale, the mythos is based on something that cannot be refuted. I do not know of the existence of any river ocean. And I think that Homer or one of the poets from past times invented the name and introduced it into his poetry. So apparently what disturbs Herodotus most is not the content of the theory, but that it is no theory at all and that it cannot be refuted. It doesn't have uh, elenkos, this possibility to use the elenkos, um, this process of questioning to refute it. How could anyone seeking authority seriously put forward such an argument? Later on, he repeats this objection explicitly. He argues that those who believe that ocean streams around the world, quote, fail to produce evidence. And he even admits to laughing at these and similar theories that are exposed as being without intelligence, not having noose, as he puts it, not on. This is the problem with myth. And whatever form it's implotted, uh, epic or other, it can't be refuted. It can't be refuted because it doesn't lie within the purview of human inquiry. Consider what the Homeric bard tells us in Iliad 2. This is handout number six. Tell me now, muses who live on Olympus, for you are goddesses and are present and know all things, while we hear only reports and know nothing. Who were the Greek captains and lords? 
the rank and file I could never name, not even if I had 10 tongues, 10 mouths, a voice that never broke and a broke and a bronze heart, unless the Olympian muses, daughters of Zeus, called to my mind all those who came under Ilion's walls, so the walls of Troy. So on the Iliadic Bard's perspective, we as humans know nothing. Contrast this with what Herodotus does in his opening sentence. This is handout number seven. Of Herodotus of Halicarnassus, this is the display of the inquiry, the historia, so that things done by human beings not be forgotten in time, not, be, uh, not become effaced by time. And that great and marvelous deeds, some displayed or performed by the Hellenes, some by the barbarians, by the non-Greeks, the Barbaroi, not lose their glory, including among others, what was the cause of their waging war on each other. So Herodotus, an individual mortal hailing from a specific city, his own name is the word's first word, his city comes second, as the work's first word, his city comes second, takes authority for his narrative, an implicit contrast with the epic bard who relies on the omniscient muses. Underscoring his own role as human inquirer, he even uses for his publication or display of his inquiry, apodexis historias, a noun cognate to the verb that describes what the actors of his histories do in displaying or achieving the deeds he will narrate. In one way, he's making a bold claim that the memory of their deeds is dependent on his judgment and activities as a historian. But on the other hand, the posture is humble. His credentials and personal responsibility point to the constraint, constraints on him as a human inquirer. And frequently he indicates what he does not know. Arguably what he, he claims to provide is not absolute truth, but opinion that gets as close to, to the truth as is humanly possible. It's very, very much along the lines of the question Akiara Champa uh, posed in the seminar a couple of weeks ago. She asked, can we grasp a sense of objectivity by comparing stories, an approximation to objectivity? Um, and I think this is very much what Herodotus is aiming at. So Herodotus sets his task as practitioner of historia against that of purveyors of myth and specifically of epic poetry. The same can be said, I think, of the divinatory knowledge that appears in the histories. It's outside the purview of human investigative capacities. So Francois Artog may be correct when he remarks that, quote, Herodotus also appeals to a second register of knowledge, the divinatory one. But in my view, Herodotus characterizes this as not history. It's not, co not connected to what the human inquirer does. Divination is of past, present, and future, and also of all places an omniscient perspective that is not available to ordinary mortals. At times, the lesson about the different character of divinatory knowledge comes through pointedly, as in the reply Herodotus reports of the Pythia at Delphi, um, who speaks for the god Apollo, to Croesus's testing of various oracles. She says, this is handout um, number eight, she says, I know the grains of sand on the beach and measure the sea, I understand the speech of the dumb and hear the voiceless. The smell has come to my sense of a hard short shelled tortoise boiling and bubbling with lamb's flesh in a bronze pot. The cauldron underneath is of bronze and of bronze the lid. Thus the priestess at Delphi correctly answers Croesus's attend uh, attendance question, which, which tested those oracles, about what he was up to on that day. He happened to be like making this big stew in a big bronze pot of like tortoise and, and lamb. As Julia Kemp, scholar of classics and religion at the University of Sydney, writes, quote, the self-statement of Delphi's capacities emphasizes the differences between human, human and divine perspectives. A strong case is made for the divine perspectives being different from that of mortal men. The God knows what no human being can possibly know. Apollo can grasp the number of the uncountable and the dimensions of the sea, something without limit and beyond human grasp. Moreover, Apollo hears what goes beyond human perception. 
In such cases, Kent concludes, quote, Herodotus uses Delphic oracle stories as the vehicle for statements that require a greater authority than the historian can possess. Rather than, as Altog puts it, arrogating to himself a type of oracular authority, I would argue that Herodotus sets human history directly against that. And here I'd like to invoke Lawrence Hemming's excellent paper in the series, its discussion of scholars of Thomas of Aquinas, to say it's notable that Herodotus does not equate um, divine thought with human history, but does keep these things separate. We can speak of a kind of rival history running through the histories, which is that of the Delphic Oracle, which speaks truth reflected in the hexametric poetry, that's, that's Homer's meter, that punctuates the history's prose text uh, when, when Herodotus is reporting um, verbatim oracular responses. But it's one that remains separate from the human effort to uncover and report human perceptions. His history is arguably the opposite of absolute history. Delphi's divine perspective perhaps enshrines what Hegel takes as the singular unity of the absolute. History for Herodotus is about something completely different, something that stands opposed to that kind of absolute truth that only the divine could access, Homer's muses, um, Apollo, and so on. The pa passage back at handout three is just one example of how Herodotus uses topolion and cognate expressions to denote events of long ago in contrast with those of more recent times. He underscores how the passing of time produces change, and by historicizing himself, he envisages a future vantage point back on the here and now. The potential for change is for him one of the few constants of the historical process. It impels him to memorialize the past and makes that project challenging since the historian can't assume continuity across time, whether in customs, a huge interest of his, identities, character, even perhaps in the very nature of individuals, as we saw in the case of Minos. He underscores how the passage of time may affect societal change, as well as wearing away human memories, rendering events exitela effaced, like the monument invoked it at handout seven in the very first lines of the histories, a monument whose inscriptions have worn away over the course of time and become difficult to read. The deliberate and thoroughgoing way in which Herodotus displays his awareness of historical time challenges Bernard Williams's suggestion in Truth and Truthfulness that Herodotus was only beginning to be anxious about these questions whereas Thucydides first engaged with them rigorously, inventing historical time, as Williams put it, uh, puts it, and discovering objectivity as a stance. In fact, Herodotus continually reminds us of the methodic, methodological and epistemological barriers that stand in the historian's way as he seeks to access accurate knowledge about the distant past. As Elizabeth Irwin, um, she's a classicist at the University of Columbia, um, has insisted his skeptical stance in relation to Minos is an attitude that permeates the histories. Arguably the most striking feature of the work is its concern with the veracity question. As Fowler has reminded us, it's in its critical approach to the past, acknowledging rather than eliding the distance that separates past from present, that Historia is most markedly dif different from its poetic and prose predecessors. Herodotus instead presents, us, uh, presents himself as a narrator who, to quote the important findings of Carolyn de Wilde, um, is claiming to piece together as best he can a reasonable representation of the world by paying attention to the real data from the past that confront him. His contract, contract with readers is founded upon a secular common sense, as de Wilde puts it, which enables understanding of, quote, the ordinary human world full of confusing contingencies and change over time. His historiographical narrative is a, quote, specific and idiosyncratic kind of diachronic narrative that privileges reality, as de Wilde says. What it offers 
in the words this time of Christian Maya, is a multi-subjective contingency-oriented account. So where does this leave us in terms of our guiding question about the essence of history? I've already, already pointed to some important aspects of historiography, according to Herodotus, and indicated ways he sets his own activities as a practitioner of historia off from those of purveyors of myth, including Homer, and of divine knowledge. Now I'd like to move to my argument for perception as essence. The germ of this is already to be found in the sixth century prose writer Hecateus. As Aaron notes in our seminar description, Hecateus of Miletus wanted to establish the, the truth as a means of, quote, resolving the numerous and often absurd stories of the Greeks. The means by which Hecateus reaches truth is significant too. He writes, and you can find this in handout number nine, I write these things as they appear to me to be true. So connecting truth with his individual human perception. This represents a major break from the epic poet, who, is, as we saw back at handout six, is dependent on divine omniscience of the muses <clears throat> without that crutch he's ignorant. Being dependent on human judgment makes the whole phenomenon of history writing wedded to direct sensory experience. History is the development of a secular narrative is all about paying attention, as Carolyn DeWald puts it. Attention to the details, attention to, as Mark Twain put it, one damn thing after another. The less ladylike history boys version has already come up in the seminar. But not only does Herodotus give us his own distinct perspective, he also includes the perspectives and interpretations of his informants and in the communities whose history and ideas and practices he preserves. Confronted with these divergent traditions, he commonly sets two or more versions side by side. So in reporting a third highly controversial account of why the Argives failed to join the Greek campaign against Persia, he remarks, this is handout 10, I'm obliged to say what is said, legain telegomena, telegomena, the thing said, but I'm not in any way obliged to believe it. And this principle applies to my entire account. The upshot is a thoroughly plural and polyphonic history that invites readers, including future readers, to play a part in judging truth about the past. Um, and the, in the case of future readers, potentially bring to bear their own future perspective that might have more, you know, more helpful information to bring to bear than, than, than Herodotus had himself. Arguably, there's a political aspect as well here, something democratic in the non-elite sense of that term, about the effort to give voice to the opinions of others across the sexes, across ethnicities, across statuses, and to attempt to really climb into the thought world of those various groups. Thucydides follows in a similar vein and in including opposed speeches that put readers in the position of evaluating the claims being made. Xenophon's select history of fourth century um, Greece, the, the Hellenica, reflects a conception of the past that, uh, that like Herodotus's, underscores complexity, contingency, and change. Turning history into a tissue of perceptions and structuring his entire history or at least I've made this up, the argument that he, he, that he does, around the pattern of expectations foiled, he goes so far as to dispense with informants and source citations to instead found much of his narrative on the expressly subjective perspectives of historical actors. In this way, he expresses a narrative form his interest in the non-rational, emotive, effective aspects of history and the relevance of those aspects in determining historical outcomes his history is emphatically perception driven. So I've argued that what we find in Herodotus uh, and Xenophon and to some extent Thucydides is a clear demarcation of history as a human phenomenon grounded in human judgments and subjective perspectives. The closest the historian can get to the truth is well-grounded well opinion and the well-grounded part 
is vitally important, at least for Herodotus and Thucydides. Rival perspectives are not equally valid or often not. The historian judges them where that's possible, dismisses them where necessary, and refuses to judge when the material is obscured in the mythical past. In the final section of my paper, I turn to defending the Greek historians. I'd like to make the case that Herodotus's focus on perceptions, perspectives, and so forth, means we must let him off the hook from the charges made against the historians a couple of weeks ago by Professor Eva Domanska and her fascinating talk urging us to dehistoricize the past. In Herodotus's histories, one discerns no trace of the 19th and 20th centuries century historians' legitimation of imperialism. One finds rather an urgent warning to the contemporary, uh, to contemporary Athenian, but also other imperialists, Spartan, Persian, future imperialists too. In the persuasive reading of Pascal Payen at the University of Toulouse, Herodotian ethnographies represent the perspective and resistance of would-be victims of Persian imperialism. So, and this is a huge chunk, there's like half of the history is devoted to these empowering those conquered peoples. Herodotus founds his ethnographies on local perspectives. So he explains the divergence of the Persians' sacrificial practices from the Greeks by the fact that the Persians regard the Greeks as foolish for anthropomorphizing the gods, for thinking that the gods take human form. Flipping on their head, complacent Greek perspectives, he notes that the, Egyptian, that the Egyptians judge people to be barbaroi, to be foreigners, if they don't speak Egyptian. Barbaros is the term um, for, for unintelligible speech that the Greeks used for non-Greek speakers, like ba ba ba, you know, makes you sound like a sheep. Ian Moyer of the University of Michigan argues that Herodotus took from Egyptian priests their sophisticated approach to the deep past, in which case he was deeply invested in non-Western perspectives and intellectual capacities. And far from indulging in mere tolerance of others' perspectives, he dramatically stages, as you can see if you take a look at handout 11, the notion that you are mad, not only not to respect your own culture's norms, but not to respect those of other people's too. Um, and as he ends, um, I've given one possible translation of the famous lines at the end, uh, nomos or nomoi, um, custom as, as king. Again, in Herodotus's vision, women are, are the guardians of culture, and his history spotlights the vital importance of female agency, uh, and thus across statuses. So it's an intelligent slave woman whom he shows saved the life of the baby Cyrus the Great, future king of Persia. He uncovers by measurement, he says, that the female prostitutes labor in constructing the tomb of the Lydian king Eliates was more than that of the other parties who helped build it. Frequently, he deploys the activities of the historian, in this case, measuring elsewhere, carefully listening to informants' accounts and judging alternative versions to puncture the problematic received assumptions of his readers. For his part in his historiographical Hellenica, um, or so, I, so I'm arguing in another context, uh, he connects he, there. He connects the entitlement mindset of Spartan imperialists with their ultimate failure. This depiction of Sparta reveals his negative verdict on a hegemonic or imperialistic worldview that emphasizes difference and hierarchy. An implicit opposition to such an outlook, Xenophon endorses the value of connections, laying emphasis on what unites us as human beings rather than what sets us apart. And I should say there's a really important exception to this and that he is not enlightened when it comes to slaves, or at least there are hints, but on the whole, yeah, he's not. So aside from slaves, I think this is true. In this way, um, in this way his history draws attention to the values of coexistence and codependency underscored by Professor Demanska. Um, and indeed, eco-feminist eco perspectives can, I think, be productively applied. Elsewhere, this time in a Socratic dialogue, he introduces an insect, the bee, as a metaphor for productive 
community building. In another work again, the microhistory analysis, he introduces the perspectives of animals. Um, observing and writing about a festival, he himself established that the sanctuary is so lush that, quote, even the draft animals which bring people to the festival have their feast also. I propose that we can see the emphasis laid by our classical Greek historians on divergent perceptions and perspectives as in their view, the essence of history. Or alternatively, as a challenge to the very notion that, yes, that history might have an essence. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. That was really interesting um, and stimulating. Um, I'm going to open the floor to questions, but I'm going to jump in first. Um, I was wondering if you could draw on uh, a, a notion of uh, or a relation of truth and meaning in Herodotus. I was thinking, um, I was thinking a lot about um, this in terms of Thucydides and in terms of, I suppose Arthur Danta, who who came up with this idea of the the ideal chronicler, this this uh, this uh, omniscient being who who had within his grasp the entire facts every single fact ever collected about history so he knew absolutely everything about history except the you know the the, the one um the one problem with that is he didn't have an understanding of, of where history was going he didn't stand on on where history went to so he couldn't derive meaning from this future uh, retrospective understanding and i think you notice that a lot in Thucydides, and I wonder if it's similar in Herodotus then, you know, is there a more, a more fundamental truth at play where you can derive meaning from these perceptions? Yeah, yes, I think there is. And I think this is one way in which Aristotle, you know, you may, you, some of you may be aware of Aristotle's quite using Herodotus and dismissing, you know, historia, uh, history is about, you know, the, the things that have actually happened, what Alcibiades did or what happened to him, you know, he says Her Herodotus would be a history, even if you put it into verse, because it's about this kind of just what happened, which is, is no measure of what might happen, of meaning, you know, greater human meanings, as you say. But absolutely, in, in Thucydides, we have a very explicit statement of this, of the fact that there's sort of a, a circularity, a pattern to things, um, sort of human meaning, um, over time, things actually will happen again in similar ways. Um, and yeah, in Herodotus, there's a philosophical um, sort of strand that runs right through the histories uh, where you get the, the very same sense of um, like philosophical meaning, um, perhaps most dramatically highlighted in book one in the programmatic story of, um, of Solon and Croesus. Solon, the Athenian, sort of poet, politician, wise man, um, talking to the, giving advice to the king of, um, of, of Lydia. And yeah, and the truths expressed there, um, they're philosophical ones. And they're the ones that I would say um, Herodotus is whole, like the contingency oriented character of his account underscores the idea that, um, yeah, you know, um, uh, Sumpharaz, or um, the Greek word accident, is, is everything. Um, um, chance, you don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next, and this is the defining feature of the human condition. Change, you don't, you don't know, which is why you can't judge a man happy until he has died, until he's died after a good life, um, you know, spent in um, fighting for his community, gaining um, a good reputation, um, all, all of these sorts of things, which is why, you know, when Croesus asks Solon in this paradigmatic moment, you know, so having seen all my, my palaces and so forth, my treasuries, um, is there anyone you've seen who you judge happier, happiest of, 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 of all people? And he's, Croesus is wanting to, um, to have Solon recognize him as the happiest of all, but Solon says, no, um, you know, judge no man happy until he is dead. Um, yeah, so this kind, um, and then like the, the story of Croesus manages to do two things at once, even as um, Herodotus is preserving contingency, a sort of a, an overdetermined picture of the explanations involved and what happens um, to Croesus. At the same time, there's, there's uh, a pattern of action, which is one of 
um, power leading to delusions, leading to um, a fall from power. Um, and, and this is a, is, is a pattern that is, um, you know, that you find elsewhere in the histories and that contributes to the sense of a warning to um, would-be imperialists. Does that answer your question? I mean, I'd argue that it's, it's implicit. Herodotus's yeah. sort of lessons, um, sort of philosophical lessons, or lessons about the meaning of human life, absolutely they're there. They're, 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 they tend to be more um, in, implicit than in some of the, the later, more explicitly moralizing historians. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, Luke? Uh, thanks, Aaron. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah. I'm on a I'm on a laptop in the UK for a change, so I'm in a I'm actually in the right time zone for once. Uh, thank you, uh, Emily. Um, I, I mean, you basically you persuade me, um, but I I have uh, I, I have I guess a minor quibble and a question. But the minor quibble is, you know, you you talk about Herodotus's interest in the Egyptians as sort of an acceptance of non-Western thought, and I mean in modern terms that would be true, but. You know, in ancient terms, I'm not sure that really makes a lot of sense. I mean, he was from Halicarnassus. I mean, he's a Turk in modern terms. He's not a Greek. He's culturally Greek. There's a, there's a sort of a Greek world, if you like. But, but yeah, but it's he, a Greek he's, colony. Yeah, um, but he, he's not. I mean, Persian rule in his childhood. We have to be, you know, we we have to be, I think, quite sensitive to the 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 context there. But there's just there's just not a contrast between Western and non-Western in the ancient world that maps in any ready way onto our own deployment of these concepts and so i think you know in a way it's what you say is true but you know it, it doesn't really quite have the sense that one would want it to if one were wanting to defend somebody against kind of contemporary prejudices against non-western thought or what have you but the interesting thing that struck me in that regard is of course plato also admires the egyptians but for very different reasons because plato thinks the Egyptian culture has achieved a sort of timelessness in its political institutions. So it's for almost exactly the opposite reason, if you like, uh, to Herodotus, who, according to you, thinks of the Egyptian priests as exemplary custodians of the past. And this raises a question of why, if, and I think you're, you know, you're right about this, Herodotus represents a genuinely new kind of consciousness or relationship towards the past. The thing that didn't happen in Greek philosophy was any development of a philosophy of history in the sense of uh, an, an attempt to work out a theory of the conditions of historical knowledge, because there were people who were clearly doing it. I mean, Herodotus dies just as Plato is born, but Plato and Thucydides overlap, and presumably there are plenty of these other people around who are writing histories. The two greatest Greek philosophers, Plato and Aristotle, neither of them see fit to theorize about this, despite their interest in you know i mean aristotle gets up and invents logic for breakfast you know oh i'll invent biology today and uh, tomorrow i'll do physics and the day after that i'll do rhetoric you know so that the guy is incredibly fecund in the way he proliferates disciplines but history is not amongst them or at least as far as we know but there is a remark in the poetics to the effect that poetry is better than history because it's more philosophical and by that aristotle means it's more universal now, on your account of Herodotus, he seems to be interested in the genuine individual, the, the things that have been done by specific people, um, you know, the, the, the reasons behind specific events. And that is an authentically historical way to think about things. But it, it, but it is precisely what Plato and Aristotle are not interested in, it seems to me, with respect to the past. So Raymond Goyce has an article on Plato or Thucydides is the kind of existential choice that confronted the West, if you like, by which he means Plato typifying philosophy and an interest in the universal and Thucydides as um, standing for an interest in the particular. But I think this is a bit off because what Thucydides is interested in when it gets to the Peloponnesian War is, is what he thinks of as an exemplary case. He goes into great detail over the Peloponnesian War, but it's not for the sake of the Peloponnesian War. It's because this is the kind of thing that is really important. You know, the, this is the sort of conflict that may happen again, in other words. And if you look at what Plato is doing in the Republic when he, he sort of recounts a theory of historical cycles of development, um, 
this is just something that repeats and repeats and repeats. So past events are interesting to him. He had, clearly he has a sense of his being in time and he has, there is an account of Greek history and so on in Plato. But what really interests him in the past is the extent to which I suppose in a way we can use it in this predictive fashion because we can, we can see that all of this has happened before and all of it's going to happen again. It's just going to repeat, 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 repeat. That is not, of course, what the historian uh, as such uh, does. So Thucydides is in a sense a regression from Herodotus, if you like, although he comes later, because insofar as Herodotus is interested in the genuinely individual, whereas Thucydides is interested in the exemplary case, Thucydides is actually somewhat closer to this notion of universality than, uh, the, than Herodotus is, who seems to be genuinely focused on the specific, the individual, the particular, and the contingent. But Aristotle and Plato don't want anything to do with, with, with all that. And I suppose, first of all, I'd like you to tell me if you think this kind of diagnosis is on the money. But secondly, whether you agree that this sort of sets the tone for the subsequent development of Western thought, because even in the Christian idiom, there's a sort of, you know, the, the Christian interest in history is, is essentially mythical. It's not until the Renaissance that we even begin to get back to something like the kind of historical interest that, that Herodotus displays. And it's not until perhaps the 18th century that we begin to recapture or, or perhaps to generate even for the first time um, some sense of the theory of historical knowledge in this sense of knowledge of the individual, because Western philosophy and Western religion has systematically marginalized it, perhaps not intentionally, but nevertheless, that's been the effect. So it is Plato who sets the tone, but in, but in a way, by, by, um, by talking about the importance of, of events as exemplary cases, Thucydides doesn't help the cause either, actually. So anyway, I'd just like to know what you think about all that. Yeah, so I would, to some extent, defend Thucydides, while also arguing that he's a bit of a regression, in my view, from Herodotus, even though um, I can agree with you on that. How I defend him is that he, I think, so I would argue that both he and Herodotus are kind of one thing that is really interesting and impressive about them is the way they try to negotiate this tension between, you know, Herod Aristotle, just historians in one camp, philosophers in another. But both these historians are trying to do two things. I would say Thucydides is interested in the specifics, the detail. Like there's no way you can read through that whole text in Greek, um, like as I do with my, my, my grad students, and not see him as really interested in the specifics and the detail. He's not only interested in that war for, you know, as a, as a, as a, a paradigm. I think he, he really and truly, I think it's because of this, the sense that it's it's through the detail again that you get to um, you know to 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 uh, an account that can hold muster that can pass muster that can um, can can have this objectivity to it. Um, at the same time, and I think you especially see this. Um, well, a couple of times he makes direct authorial statements um, about yeah about this kind of way in which. Um, events will happen again in ways that he says that are you know that are, that are nearly resembling those that have you know that have have happened before um but but in the speeches as well um this is one moment i mean the, the greeks understood speeches as you know as as, as fictional yeah you, of course you include speeches homer did it's words and 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 deeds as well that you need to turn this into a proper um you know um, memorial of, of stuff that's happened. He, he uses those speeches, just as Herodotus did in Solon's speech, um, as a moment to kind of take flight into more philosophical domains, like, a, you know, Pericles funeral oration or whatever. I think some of these speeches are really getting readers to think in quite abstract ways about principles, some of them historiographical principles. So, so I would maybe argue that, yeah, we do have philosophy of history happening. It's just it's happening in the historians. Like when, you know, you read these speeches that are really very interesting and in what they say about, you know, ca cause and effect and why people are motivated to do the kinds of things that they do. Um, also, when he expli expri uh, explicitly addresses um, what he does when it comes to speech writing, so to some extent there's this sort of almost taking flight from reality. Um, on the other hand, he also worries about the truthfulness of it. And he says in the, the sentence of Thucydides that's probably had the most ink spilled on it, 
he makes the claim that when he's writing speeches, so first of all, he's talked about what he does with Erga, with like events, he's going to basically get, um, you know, get the truest account that he can, or he's seen it himself as kind of, when it comes to speeches, he's going to try to hover between these two principles. A, he's going to try to give us the gist of what really was said, he tells us. Um, but B, he's going to famously give us tada onta in the Greek, what was necessary. What was necessary? That can be like, what was necessary for who? Like to persuade the actual people at the time, to persuade his audience, to convey these kinds of principles, um, some more philosophical principles. So it's, we're getting into really a very subject, subjective terrain, I mean, terrain of subjectivity when he makes that explicit claim, which is why so much has been written on this particular line. But yeah, so I, my take would be that he's trying to do both those things at once, which is just what Herodotus is doing as well. Where I would, I would say he's um, a little bit regressive is how he allows theory to, um, to, to turn into history. For instance, and actually Aaron mentioned this a little while ago, in his so-called archaeology, where he tells the story of you know the, the, the past, the early past. Um, he but he basically uses present time dynamics, like the fact that what matters, what counts in explaining the way things happen is 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 money and ships. And he turns this into his theory for um, you know, for, for early times. This is why, you know, the cities were sited near the coasts and you know, tyrannies with all their, their money and stuff, and this was the real mover and and, and driver. So it's like the theory that allows him to construct his history of early Greece, early in but one. Um, whereas Herodotus wouldn't accept that. Herodotus doesn't, you know, that, that's just not the way he, look, he, he, he works. He really does try to look at the, you know, stuff on the ground um, before making his, um, his case. Um, so yeah, so a bit of a defense. I have a sense that one reason the, um, the philosophers like Plato, Aristotle, one reason they seem to me to be a little bit less interested in, in history, or at least in, also in historiographical writings, seems to me that they're very interested in, and I completely agree with your characterization of them, they're not, they're not like Plato's dialogues, Xenophon's Socratic dialogues, by contrast with Plato's, really do give a sense of the importance of the contingent, the historical moment, and the particular individuals. Plato's don't. I think when it comes to like literary output, they're really interested in the big Athenian dramatic festivals. This is where everyone's going, where everyone's getting all these bad ideas, according to Plato, about, you know, people, people being shown murdering their mothers and doing stuff like this. And, and Plato's made this whole case, which is why tragedy should not, tragic, you know, crucial religious you know, festival in the city. Everyone goes to it why this should all be, this media should be, um, be, be banned. And then Aristotle comes along, Plato's kind of set the agenda. He's talked about poetry more generally as well. He's kind of set the agenda and Aristotle has to come in with his defense. And so he's really focusing on, you know, arguing against Plato. Um, and, and somehow, yeah, I think historiography, this, yes, it was um, performed, it was probably read aloud, but with smaller, um, smaller audiences, uh, not, not kind of mass audiences that were really, you know, perhaps um, shaping, like, like TV nowadays, shaping the way citizens um, might be thinking and behaving. So I'd say that that is probably why Plato is, is you know, I mean, historiography presents less of a, uh, less of a, um, less of a threat and then Plato sort of sets the agenda, but I'll be really interested in hearing like from my other, maybe my other classicists will have some different views. Um, yeah, have I addressed your questions? Some of them? That was a, a very uh, No, no uh, very much so, except, except, you know, you would have thought that even in, even in principle, Plato and Aristotle were bright enough by far to sort of see the significance of the emergence of a completely new form of understanding. And they just didn't follow up. Well, just I wonder didn't... whether, yeah, and I wonder whether um, Homer's vast dominance Maybe. Is, like, in Greek culture and society, whether that is, because it's again Homer, you can't like constantly through the 
you know, the philosophers are, are they're, they're recalling Homer, Homer and Hesiod, the two, you know, the two big, Herodotus tells us, you know, they gave us, they gave the Greeks the view of the gods, the view of humanity. So perhaps Homer and Hesiod, these are the people most often cited by the philosophers. Sure. I think history just, it's a little more niche maybe in their, in their view. <laughs> All right. <Bad> judgment, <laughs> if you ask me. <laughs> uh, Lawrence? Yeah, Emily, thank you very much indeed. Um, you, and I was amazed to be cited in uh, in your paper. Uh, uh, thank you. And I, I think it's in connection with that that I want to. I, I'm going to make a little bit of a defence that uh, of uh, uh, for Herodotus that he is doing something more like Homer is doing. And I, I wonder if I, I mean on. I was looking at the uh, at your uh, handout six, as it were. The the, 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 what these goddesses are up to, because um, I, I, take, I take what lies in the background here to be the question of the meaning of essence. And so if you have a Platonic or an Aristotelian understanding of essence, you have, as it were, an understanding of fixed presence, so that you're always matching present presence against, as it were, a fixed presence. I mean, this is how, for instance, Heidegger translates energeia. Energia is the totality of possibility, which is actuality, because it's all in act. And we are always measuring what is only partially in act. This is Heidegger's reading of Plato especially, but, but applying it through Aristotle, only partially in act against what is totally in act. But I've been pondering this question of presence in relation to history quite anxiously during these seminars and perhaps for a bit before. And I, if I look at that translation, I, I translate it very differently to the translator that you are. I don't know if it's you. Yeah, I but, think, I mean, I'm afraid it was just the load translation that I, I had. I thought, got, yeah, yeah, which is just fine. Which is just fine. <laughs> but if, let, if we look at that, este par este, te iste te panta, este par este, you goddesses, that it, to me, I read this as saying, you goddesses who are because you, you, are by being there also. The pareste, the pa, it's a duplication. You are by being co-present, such that you see. And then the burden of that panta, is that panta, Luke's panta, as it were, the panta of, of Plato and Aristotle, the panta that ends up of Hegel, of total presence, such that time and being are conflated into one thing, and therefore historical facts can be in some sense measured against a totality, which, and that was your point of your quote. I mean, I, I take Hegel's theory of time to be a derivation of, of Aquinas's reading of Aristotle's theory of time, which is that it is the actual totality of presence because it resides in the mind of God. Um, and so that's why Hegel says that time is like space uh, because, but it can only possibly be like that because because it's in the mind of God, not in our mind. Because if I then read the second page, the second uh, quotation there, the de kleos hoion aku amen ude te idmen. Iste and idmen are both from oida. They both concern what is what is possible to be seen. And so the, the, the confusion here, the, the translator's fallen for the fact that the muses who live on Olympus. So he is a bit of an Aristotelian. He's seeing that panta in terms as if Olympus was some kind of panopticon, but it's nothing of the kind. The question is, how is presence preserved? You goddesses see because you are the preservation of presence, both present presence as it is now and past present presences as they were. But we humans have to rely on the fame of what is heard. That's how I would translate the kleos hoyon akumen, akuamen, because ude ti idmen, it's not possible for us to have access to the what that was to be seen. Now, I know that's a, a, a loose and slightly naughty translation, but it is recognizing that idmen there is a perfect infinitive. In other words, this is all about 
not about what goes on on Olympus, but exactly for as it was for both Herodotus and Thucydides, how we derive the truth from what is present. So therefore, now because Aletheia doesn't really function in the way in Homer, that it begins to function certainly in the, um, at the time that Herodotus and uh, um, uh, 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 Thucydides are writing. But I'm relying here on, on Brentano's and, and um, Charles Kahn's pointing out that for Homer to be and to be true are pretty much the same thing because to be, to be true and to be out there in the open, that iste, that, that to be seen. So that the, 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 now the question for me therefore on, in terms of the essence of history is all about the panta because the panta is not the totality of all possible presence. It's not energeia such that there is a sun energia that we are all together with in some sense, but rather it's the letting be present so that the job of the historian is to let be present what was. Their job is to do that, allowing the fame of what has been heard to come to presence again, because then the, then the historian is in the position of the goddesses, the theai, um, such that the 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 that the, the the past is the historian lets the past come to presence again and that's how that's why i think that little phrase that you quoted right at the end that that, that, that phrase that runs like a thread through antiquity nomon panton basilea the, the, because how we translate nomon nomos now I'm not a classicist, but uh, uh, um, uh, uh, I'm not therefore, but, but it strikes me that the whole of Herodotus is about nomos. And if we translate nomos as law or even as custom, we are on a hiding to nothing. But if we translate it as what is allotted, what is given to be present in the present, such that, such that the nomos that is, and that's the bit that we can't get away for because nomos is get away from because nomos in its being allotted is to some extent baleful. It, it commands us to accept its truth. So this is this is to on as Alice as what cannot be got around. That's the real meaning of nomos, it seems to me, for Herodotus. Is what I wonder, therefore, is I don't think I'm disagreeing with one word of your paper, by the way, but I'm also trying to suggest that there is a rather better thread and that if we get caught up in modern, actually post enlightenment and, and, and rather and, and rather um, theistic worries about about universal um, presence and um, uh, uh, it, as Hegel does, ontotheology, if you want to give it its name, that's the name that Kant used for it, after all. Um, we throw all that away, and we worry, in fact, about presence, how past presence comes to present, comes back into the present. That's the work of the historian, it seems, which is what you are addressing. And it puts us in touch with um, uh, both Herodotus and Thucydides. And I'm going to make a little bit of a plea that it lets Homer off the hook as well, that we don't make him actually quite such a dangerous proto-Hegelian as you suggested. Okay, so yeah, I, I, thank you so much for those really wonderful comments. Um, and, and absolutely, I, I, yeah, I was simplifying in this talk. Um, I think, yes, there's also, I mean, Homer is so, so important to Herodotus as you see also in his opening lines, Aklea reminding you of, of Homer, for instance. Um, but let me start with nomos. So yeah, so I would argue that again, um, again with this, we see that kind of oscillation between two different views because there's huge emphasis in Herodotus on human communities, like a real interest in lawgivers, human lawgivers working out the nomoi that work for their communities. Um, and yet at the same time, like you have, for instance, with Lycurgus, Herodotus gives two options. He says, oh, and maybe um, Delphi gave 
Lycurgus, the constitution of the Spartans, like their whole way of life, their whole that crazy, you know, militaristic uh, way of life. Maybe Delphi gave it to them, or perhaps, um, you know, perhaps, perhaps it was the Cretan, it was influenced from the, the Cretans. I don't remember the exact details, um, but, but basically there are the two options there. Perhaps it was, as you say, kind of allotted by the divine, but there's also really emphasis on, on human beings and their, their, um, the way they sort of create laws for themselves. Um, and a, a certain example, like you have people, you know, in the case of the Persian kings, like the crazy Cambyses, you have him, you see him manipulating the system and the, 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 the um, law, the judges coming back and saying, well, I, yeah, no, Egyptian law says you shouldn't really be sleeping with your sister, but on the other hand, the king can do whatever he likes, so okay, it'll be okay. Um, so yeah, so I, I would argue that, yeah, you have moments where there's the sense that, you know, this is what, uh, what was a loss of, this is the way sort of, I mean, it was kind of coming from the gods or the way, the way things are. You, you also have um, Herodotus very, you know, actually explicitly saying Herodotus and Hesiod gave the Greeks their view of, of the gods and of the world. Like he says that, he says uh, that, um, that, that those poets did that. So you have moments of distance, um, but, but then at the same time, yeah, you have, I mean, Homeric conceptions um, that, that are really um, very important um, through the histories. Um, so also, yeah, so the conception of truth, you talked about changing conceptions of truth, aletheia, and it definitely seems to be the case that you have a shift, um, you know, shift over time, aletheia can mean, you know, what has not been forgotten, the alpha privative, with the idea, you know, like the revelithi, what's not forgotten, what, what is passed down, what, what we all agree on. Um, but there is this shift towards aletheia in the sense of what actually you can prove is the case. It's not just what people say. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's something that we're proving in more sort of methodical ways. So there's a shift there. And there's a bit of a scholarly controversy over like those early words, apodexis, and this, this word of display of, of performance, like where this is coming from, whether it's more again coming from a verb that's that's talking about the transmission of traditions, or whether it's more like kind of that's that's a, a use of the word kind of looking back to Homer, or whether it's more as people like Rosalind Thomas have argued, uh, that it can be just as much about this this verb apodecnumi, this ver so that's apodecomai is the, the idea of kind of receiving the tradition and passing it on. But it could equally well be looking ahead to what the sophists are doing, like these intellectuals using science, kind of shying away from the divine, from just accepting divine explanations to apodec numi, like display of your, your prowess, your skill in making this case that's founded on, you know, naturalistic understanding on kind of the natural scientists, the medical understandings, this kind of thing. So, you know, even there, right there in the term apodexis, that display of the historia, I, I'd argue that these two strands um, are both there. And I, yeah, I would want to really draw attention to Herodotus as kind of being quite deliberate in his, um, you know, negotiation of these things. So, so that's where, yeah, um, th this is what I think is so amazing about what he's, um, what he is, is, is doing. Um, I don't know if I've really addressed your questions, but I've tried. <laughs> Well, I'm I'm going to be cheeky and come back twice because you let because uh, 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 Aaron let Luke do that. And there's only one other hand up <laughs> so far, but <laughs> I think what I'm actually making a case for is that nomos is derived not from not from a, a dictation of the gods, but uh, but from presence itself, and that that's how I translate Alithea, and that's even how I would translate Apo Apodicnuma Apodic. No, my, I'm my, I'm not a, 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 a natural classicist, uh, um, but it, it, that that it's the sophists playing with with that which enables them to be sophists. But it's because that's already in place that they are able to do to do what they want to do. In other words, I think that there is a, a certain reading back into 
um, uh, 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 reading back into what they're what they're up to. But but if I read if I, my reading of Herodotus, which I grant is not yours uh, and doesn't have any of its sophistication, is that there is a constant addressing of deriving um, uh, of deriving the nomos. At the, at the nemein of what is allotted from presence, not from gods or goddesses, neither from neither, so that we are wrestling always with what's given, and that's that's why nomos is a problem, and sometimes that's highly humorous. You know, he jokes about it. He, he a lot of his jokes are, are around that, but nevertheless, it also has a dread character. There, there's that which cannot be got around. You know, because. <laughs> for instance, but what do you make then of the emphasis on changing Nomoi? Because this is one of the things he really is so interested in, like why it is that Nomoi sit and the fact that they do sit. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, that, that's because it's we all we are because we always because present presence always demands that we have to go back and find out how this still works. In other words, it's it's derived from the it's derived from the command of the moment not as something that's simply manipulable to, to human logic, if you like. That's, 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 I mean, we're now getting technical and I'm, I'm now feeling uh, that I've overstayed my welcome, so I'm backing up, but no, I would happily- I, I will keep on, yeah, I'm gonna- I will happily like, discuss this there. with you, at an, you know, uh, further, it, it, perhaps just between the two of us by email or something. That, that would be wonderful, it's wonderful, right. fascinating ideas, but thank, thank you. you again, thank you. Alexander. Thanks for, for this uh, great paper. I, I really enjoyed how you showed that the historians are so concerned for their responsibility to bring the truth. Um, I have a bit of a smaller question, I think, than, than the previous ones. So maybe connecting well to the, the, the gap between Homer and, and Herodotus in the sense of um, what you were saying about the oracular authority. Um, so, of course, Herodotus is making a distinction there, but um, is he not also still trying to use the, the oracular authority more uh, for um, supporting his own sort of arguments and, and views? Especially I was wondering in that concept, what context what you would make of 2.18.1, where he writes uh, about the question uh, what exactly, which lands belong to Egypt and which don't. And he says, like, the response of the Oracle of Ammon, in fact, bears witness to my opinion that Egypt is of such an extent, as I have argued, I learned this by inquiry after my judgment was already formed about Egypt. So where he sort of, his own authority and the Oracle really converge, and he's sort of stressing that he already figured it out before he even knew about the, the Oracle. Um, is that the exception that proves the rule, or is it not even relevant to the way you you see the, the relationship? Or uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And um, yeah, and I'm I, I was aware that I was kind of overstating my case just to make it kind of clear. Um, I think you're absolutely right that he does. He, uh, he yeah, it's um. He, he absolutely, on a number of occasions, he does use that, the authority of Delphi. Also like, and sometimes I think in some ways really to, yes, yeah, sometimes the example you give to support, you know, so his historical researches. At other times um, to like a number of times to support the more philosophical, the philosophical thought. And this is where again, there's sort of, I think this tension ways in which he's really distinguishing himself um, from, from, from the oracle, from other divine sources, and yet absolutely um, putting them to good use. For instance, when he says, um, you know, at the end of the, the account of Croesus, he has Croesus, you know, taking his, telling his attendants, take these chains and, and tell Delphi, you know, after all the gifts I gave Delphi, um, this is all Delphi, um, Delphi did for me was, you know, leave me, um, leave me subjugated by, by the Persians. And, and then we get the direct speech of the Pythia, which I think he says, you know, the Lydians say. So he's kind of like having his cake and eating it. He's reminding us that, you know, that the Lydians tell this story. Um, and, and we get the, the verbatim response of the Pythia, which is, you know, these are all the things that, um, that you did wrong. 
this is all, um, you know, and it's kind of also supporting the philosophical truth that, you know, human understanding is limited, that you don't know, you know, you don't, like, you know, you, you don't have um, an authority that matches the gods. Um, that's another important kind of part of the, 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 the wisdom of the histories that comes through. Um, so, yeah, and, and I mean, he really uses Delphi, especially in book one, which is kind of, uh, is uh, sort of structured around Delphi to a large extent. Um, Delphi and the understanding of the Delphic priests um, Harriet Flower has argued that a number of the stories of book one likely came from, from Delphi, just as in, in Egypt, it's the priests who have the knowledge um, that Herodotus needs, so, so too it is in, in, in Delphi. So yeah, so it's, I see himself in some ways distant, taking distance. On the other hand, uh, really registering the authority of um, this, you know, preeminent source of oracles in the Greek world, which even Thucydides, you know, even Thucydides occasionally invokes Delphic oracles as well in ways that support um, his, his theory. So yeah, I totally agree. And I think it complicates, I mean, my argument was a little bit too schematic um, because he's absolutely drawing on this authority. But I also think it's very notable and interesting how far he kind of sets himself up as doing something different. Um, but yeah, having his cake and eating it. So thank you. That's a really nice example of it. Um, is there any more questions? I might jump in again, just because there's no hands up at the moment. Um, I was wondering, actually, if you, uh, we've mentioned the sophists now, if you could draw on any possible influence of the sophists on Herodotus, um, especially in this notion of, of perception, actually, as, as, a, as an essence of history. Because... You know, the, the, the fifth century itself is a, is, could be characterized as a crisis of truth. You know, you have this kind of Aletheia related to Phusis through, through uh, the early Greek thinkers. Parmenides kind of ruptures that when he, when he dichotomizes Aletheia and Doxa. And then you've got this development of, of a notion of Doxa through the Sophists, particularly through Protagoras and Gorgias and then through Antiphon. Uh, which is, you know, which is where Plato comes in in the fourth century as a, as a response in terms of that. So I wonder, is Herodotus himself engaged in that in that debate in, in his conception of, of perception? Yeah, yes, I would think he is. And I think in Herodotus's time, I mean, I suppose I'd argue that really it's with Plato, with his axe that he has to grind defending Socrates, with Plato and Xenophon. That's where it becomes very clear, this kind of the opposition of the sophos and then the sophistes, the sophist, the sophist and the wise man. Um, but at this point, I mean, the sophists are working on all sorts of different questions, many of them relevant to what Herodotus is doing. The doc, they're close to the doctors, they are doctors, some of them. I mean, they're sort of united by an interest in rhetoric, which is it's very clear that Herodotus too. I mean, yeah, this is your mode of making your persuasive case. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think Herodotus sees himself as, um, you know, as sort of belonging to, to this group. I don't think he's setting himself against any of them, but I think absolutely he's, uh, he's really interested in the sophists and what they're doing. Sometimes it's very clear that he's giving us a more nuanced picture, for instance, than the quite um, straightforward environmental determinism you get in some of the sophists. So occasionally you have signs of this, like when, you know, Cyrus says soft man's, soft, soft lands breed soft men, like that kind of idea. But Herodotus has really shown, you know, it's way more complicated than that. And the per Persians are not, as Chris Dowling would put it, not manby pandies. Um, he's, I think some of the sophists, so some of that, they just come in so many different stripes. Um, I mean, one really, like you have Antiphon on truth talking about, um, some of these schematic oppositions that some of the sophists like to sort of peddle, like Greeks and Persians, these kind of um, oppositions. But Antiphon comes back to, actually comes back to Phusus to make the argument that we all share the same Phusus, we laugh with the same, you know, we laugh and we, we cry and we all of this. Um, and, and those who um, separate themselves off from other cultures are the ones who are barbarized. Antiphon basically says something like that. So you can totally see Herodotus and some of what he says about, yeah, the nomos fusus, 
um, discussion that is happening at the time, you can totally see him kind of um, just working in a very nuanced way with, with these sorts of concepts and bringing them in, like the tale of, you know, Darius, I included on handout 11, I think it was, bringing in Darius as setting up this experiment, having, you know, the response of the, um, the Greeks to the idea of eating parents like these Indian tribes do. And the Greeks just say, you couldn't pay us enough to make us do that. And then the Indian response to, um, to doing what the Greeks do, which is like burning their dead. And the Indians like cry and they're appalled and shocked. They're way more shocked than the Greeks who are just like, oh, couldn't pay us enough. Um, so it's just, yeah, absolutely. I think he's, um, he's in this thought world. And Rosalind Thomas has really beautifully brought out how his, um, his methods of argument um, just totally, he, he's doing what lots of the sophists are doing in terms of some of his polemical arguments, in, like in the Egypt book, for instance. Yeah, some of the sophists are so simplistic. Like there, there's the desoi logoi, like the double arguments that you can bring into connection with Herodotus as this emphasis on polyphony, on what different groups say. But then Herodotus, again, it's just, it's not, it's not so schematic. Great, thank you very much. Um, there's no more hands up, so I'll say thank you again to Emily for a wonderful paper, very stimulating paper. Um, thank you as well to everyone for the discussion. Uh, that was excellent. Um, and I look forward to seeing everyone again next week. And I should just thank everyone for hanging around and listening to a class. <laughs> very kind of you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.